Exodus and chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Well, Exodus is the story of God's rescue of his people. The story of God's rescue of his people. That's what Exodus is. And these days, of course, there's a newer story, though, right front and center in our thinking. And that's the narrative that you know of the big rescue from COVID-19 that we're waiting on, led by government and health experts leading a bumpy rollout of the vaccinations. Reading Exodus, I can't help contrasting these stories, that is the, the people of Israel and us in this moment, contrasting them. Both stories of people caught in difficult circumstances, groaning for freedom. Well, reading exercise, or reading Exodus, I'd love to invite you. Come and, and follow the narrative here in the Bible and watch carefully how things transpire. People over the centuries and, and uh, all throughout human history have been stirred and directed by the book of Exodus to see that whatever else is on offer in any given season, we need to know that God is the one who's ultimately in control and that it's in him and it's him alone who rescues. That's the story of Exodus. Well, who's in charge amid slavery, exploitation, and mass murder? Well, that's really the question that arises from chapter one. Who's in charge? In a couple of ways, this is the question as we start reading Exodus. And, and the narrator, the writer here, is prompting us to, to see that this book effectively picks up where the first book, Genesis, left off. Joseph and his family, 70 people, verse 5, who in the language of Genesis were fruitful and increased greatly, verse 6. Well, that's the people of Israel, but who's in charge? Well, we'll look for a moment firstly at verse 8 of chapter 1 in Exodus. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Well, who's this? Well, the simple fact is that we are not given the name of this king. We don't know who exactly this pharaoh of Egypt is. Something that commentators have wondered at for a long time. But for the writer of Exodus, this detail doesn't appear to matter. Maybe the name of this king is deliberately left unnamed as was an Egyptian practice, so as not to glorify the enemy. Well, whoever he is, his speech and what he says and does soon tells us what he's going to be like. Have a look at verse 9. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us, and escape from the land. Well, that's how this king, this unnamed pharaoh, speaks. Now, from this, then, there develops a callousness as he then approaches the Hebrew midwives. Verse 16, look at what he says. Verse 16, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him but if it is a daughter, um, she shall live. This king is unnamed, yet he's powerfully cruel. And this new king inflicts not just oppressive slavery on the people of Israel, but added to that is, is summarized in, in, well, added to what's summarized in verse 13. Have a look as ruthlessly making their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. Added to that is, is a horrendous campaign of mass murder. We rightly ask who's in charge. There's a clue though in verse 17 of chapter one. Look at how the midwives respond. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt, this unnamed king commanded them, but let the male children live. We're only a few lines into this book, but we can see that the battle lines are drawn. And this unnamed Pharaoh is not just rallying against a group of people he doesn't like. Instead, he's really setting himself up against God 
the God who told his people in the book of Genesis to be fruitful and multiply, the God who promised through Abraham a great nation, a people through whom all the peoples of the world would be blessed. God, as we read here, verse 20, God who dealt well with the midwives who refused to believe this wicked diktat of a new king and who let the male children live. You see, it was God who enabled his people in the face of this awful campaign, now widened as a command to all the people in verse 22. Um, Have a look. Every son, this king of Egypt commands his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. But in spite of all that, God enabled his people to multiply and to grow strong. So who is in charge? Who's in charge when campaigns are waged against God's people today? Who's in charge when coronaviruses wreak havoc? I can't be alone in sometimes watching the powers that be and wondering that question. But the answer on these pages of scripture is that whatever opposition, whatever hostility and power is mounted, there is a higher sovereign hand at work. Now this will look different in in your personal circumstances um, and in mine. But let's realize again that our only means of deliverance lies with the Lord God alone, whatever we face into. Well, there's an opening lesson from the book of Exodus. Now, immediately, the the narrator in Exodus, he's moving the story along here to the birth of one of these vulnerable baby boys, showing us where the power really lies. Now, now not, of course, um, in this baby. That's not what the, the, the writer is doing here. He doesn't want us to see Moses as the one who has the power. The baby is though, if you have a look at chapter two, verse two, this description of the baby, he was a fine child. That word good, the same as at the start of Genesis. He's a good, he's a fine child. But for his first three months of life, he has to be hidden away by his mother. No, we can't help but notice that these events are in the hands, not of a a new ruler being raised up, but of the sovereign God behind all these events. Um, The things that are happening, the events, they're not at the mercy of a ruthless Pharaoh, for as we read on, the baby is placed in a basket, a basket that's coated with bitumen. And incidentally, the word basket used here in Exodus 2 is the same word used for ark in Genesis 6, another vessel coated in bitumen, another vessel pointing to God's salvation. And then this baby is put among the reeds at the riverbank. You can see what's happening here. You've got a stunning undermining of the Pharaoh's evil decree in chapter one. And this boy Israelite is wonderfully rescued. And we read now that he ends up becoming the son of Pharaoh's daughter, chapter two, verse 10. And in contrast to the unnamed king, this rescued Hebrew, Hebrew boy is given a name. He's Moses. He's the one drawn out of the water. He's the rescued one. And what this amazing account is doing, as well as relating what happened, um, it's speaking of God's sovereignty, God's rescue from even the most dire of circumstances. And all of a sudden, we're confronted with this major theme in these first 18 chapters of Exodus. And the the answer to the big question posed in chapter one, who's really in charge? Well, that answer is God is in charge. God is the one who rescues. God rescues. And he hears, and he remembers, and he sees, and he knows, chapter two. I want you to step back for a moment and just think about little Moses here. Moses, who's reminding us of God's rescue of his people in the past through the the ark, the basket, and then the ark in Genesis. And, and, And now this little baby helping to set up the amazing events that will unfold in Egypt for the entire enslaved nation of Israel. 
in difficult circumstances, the Bible counsels us. Our rescue comes not from ourselves or our really good ruler or the best health care or the most justice that can be meted out by a, a government we put in place, but from the God who rescues. Well, that's a really needed and comforting picture for you and for me today. Now, whether it's, it's mental or, or physical health problems that are sitting with us at the moment, or whether it's a painful set of circumstances blowing up for which we feel we aren't able to manage things, the Bible reminds us of God's sovereign hand and his amazing rescue in past events and in the days to come. I hope you'll see that as we start reading this book of Exodus. Now, now when you read the Psalms, that reassurance comes out quite a lot for those that were thinking about what God has done in the past. Again and again, they look back to what God has done, and therefore, it gives them hope that God can be trusted to keep his promises in the future. Do you see that step? Looking back at what God has done in the past, and then having confidence and hope in what God can do in the future. There's an example that we started our service with in Psalm 77. Let me read it to you. The, the, the songwriter says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. And then right at the end of, of that psalm, the final verses read, your way, God, your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Do you see Exodus being recalled as evidence of God's faithfulness in the past and therefore good reason to keep trusting him in the present and in the future? Well, I wonder would that help us in these days too? Now we're back in Exodus and suddenly from verse 11, the narrative is moving forward again. Um, Moses is now a young man. It's, it's not a particularly nice story as you've heard already, as Joshua read it. Moses takes it upon himself, verse 12, to kill an Egyptian who was beating up um, one of his own Hebrew people. And then Moses, well, he covers his tracks, but not good enough. And soon, verse 15, Pharaoh finds out, and he tries to kill Moses. So Moses, well, he has to get out, and he goes to the land of Midian. Now then there's another incident recorded here um, of his standing up for the daughters of a priest called Ruel. Now eventually, one of these women becomes his wife. And you have to be asking yourself as you read this, why would the writer of Exodus take the time to tell us both of these incidents. What's, what's behind this? Of course, at one level, these events took place. But what's the, the narrator's purpose? Where is he asking us to look? Well, again, as the, the commentators have rightly pointed out, it really looks like we're getting a sneak preview here. All of this is deliberate. The writer of Exodus would have us see a glimpse of God's deliverance, even in the backstory of this rescued Israelite boy. And, and the language shows that too. L look at verse 17 of chapter 2. We read that the shepherds came and, 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 and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them, these daughters, and watered their flock. See the language? Moses saved these daughters, and he gave their flocks water. What is God poised to do for his people? under their painful oppression of slavery that we read about in chapter 1, and this anti-God regime of the unnamed Pharaoh, well, God will save them and give them water. And so here, in the, the backstory of Moses, is just a glimpse of God's sovereign plan unfolding, even in the, the flawed character of, of the young man Moses. Now, just for a moment, I want you to look at the last part, the very last few verses in Exodus chapter 2, where we're up to. We're, we're back in Egypt now, away from Midian, 
where Moses was, and we saw those incidents with the daughters. And we're back in Egypt now with this theme of God's suffering people being described. Look at verse 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. The difference now from chapter 1 is that the people from the depth of their slavery are a praying people. Groaning, yes, because of their slavery, but now crying out for help. And what does God do? Well, God hears and God remembers. Remembers his promises back in Genesis. His promises to make of Abraham a great nation. To bless all the people through him. And God saw his suffering people. And God knew. Exodus is is much more than an epic story. And I must say that in our house, we love the movie Prince of Egypt. But what we need to see here is the sovereign, mighty God listening and hearing his people's prayers, even when we can't see much else going on. See that God is the God who rescues. And the details of how God will save his people, the details of what will happen to these people as they are rescued from Egypt, that that doesn't happen immediately, but we're going to see those worked out in the chapters to come. But will you allow this powerful account from Exodus to remind you to trust God even when you can't see the next chapter? Now, it's very likely that you, like me, have been anxious this past while, wondering how everything is going, where it's all headed, probably asking that same question the narrator of Exodus 1 is pointing at us. Who's in charge? Where's all this headed? The answer you see from Scripture is startlingly simple, but often overlooked. Who's in charge? Well, it's the God who rescues. And when you keep reading the Bible and reflect on what Exodus is describing about baby Moses, it's not long before you remember something else. You remember back to to Christmas. Remember that detail about Jesus' own childhood? Jesus, you see, he faced similar threats from a king who instigated a mass murder plot. And Jesus himself as a baby had to be run out of his own country for his life. Exodus and the amazing rescue of God's people is pointing us, you see, to God's ultimate redemption plan through Christ at the cross. Perhaps this will prompt you to pray again. Pray now to the God who hears, the God who remembers his promises, who sees his people in every circumstance we're going through, and the God who knows, the God who gave his son for you. Well, our last song is going to help us reflect on Christ, our Redeemer. The chorus we need to keep singing today, and indeed for the rest of our lives, is the Lord is my salvation. Um, Listen to the first verse. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea. And I'm safe on this solid ground. What's that? The Lord is my salvation.